Hey, let's talk just uh, kind of general about uh, bone uh, pathophysiology and bone diseases before we go back into to joints. Uh, so this is just kind of a schematic of uh, the uh, growth part of bone, just to remind you of the basic physiology of bone growth. Here's the epiphysis out here. And you can see the epiphyseal artery and the uh, 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 the, the growth, the primary growth plate here, which we can see across here, uh, and uh, yeah, it's in the, the the different cellular layers to the growth plate. Uh, here are those end arteries that we've been talking about that go down into the to the growth plate. This is the area where bacteria will tend to get all clogged up in the small end arterioles, which uh, leads to uh, collections of abscess here, which is typical where you get Brody's abscesses and, and so forth. And then here's the growth plate, which eventually will uh, will fuse. And then in the adult, obviously, it doesn't work anymore. And then if we uh, uh, kind of look at the bone here, this would be in the diaphyseal part of the bone. And here you can see the cortex out here where 95% of the weight bearing has occurs during the diaphysis as opposed to the metaphysis and epiphysis that we talked about before. And then if you look carefully at the cortical bone, you have all these haversian canals. If you remember, these are a constant remodeling of the bone because like in any rigid structure, with stresses and strains, you'll get cracks. And those cracks will fuse together and perform uh, macro cracks and eventually fractures if you don't remodel the bone. So this is the reason if you have devascularized bone, you'll end up getting fractures through it because uh, the normally the, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the remodeling, you, you have uh, cores of remodeling which occur where osteoclast resorb bone, osteoblast right down new bone so that you get new bone that uh, extends across those micro cracks uh, so that they don't coalesce. And that's why bone can exist for 100 years in somebody without ever fracturing, whereas you can have uh, steel, uh, <clears throat> which may be much stronger than bone, but over 30 or 40 years of constant wear and tear, you'll get stress fractures uh, in those, which is one of the reasons why they, they have very careful maintenance on airplanes, uh, check those ahead of time. And... Uh, and why you have end of life much earlier in planes than you do in human beings, because there's no active remodeling of the micro cracks in the steel of a of an airplane wing. So uh, this uh, very complicated way in which uh, the bone is uh, devised, uh, and we can see all these area of Haversian canals, and this is kind of what a system would look like through the cortex, where you get these almost randomly oriented. Uh, uh, versant canals, which are constantly remodeling the bone and getting rid of the, of the cracks. And uh, therefore, in the bone, you have uh, active cells, even though it's rigid, which, are, which we'll talk more about in a little bit about the osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And just a, a kind of a evaluation of the, of the complex structure of, uh, of cortical bone. And this is a typical cell within the cortical bone, which is important. Uh, there, there are a number of different kinds of cells that are important to maintain the, the physiology of bone. So this is kind of the cortical bone. Uh, so what I'd like to spend more time about now is really the trabecular bone, because that's where, where we see a lot of pathology on MR, which we don't see on x-rays. Uh, which we have to kind of evaluate what the abnormal MR signal is this like. This scene depicts how bone is remodeled in the spine of a healthy premenopausal woman. The vertebral body is composed of the two main types of bone, an outer shell of dense cortical bone surrounding trabecular bone, which, as we zoom in, we see is comprised of a honeycomb-like network of trabecular plates and bars. To initiate a new remodeling cycle, 
mononucleated osteoclast precursor cells leave the peripheral circulation for sites on the bone surface. Once there, these cells fuse to form multinucleated osteoclasts. The osteoclasts remove the old bone matrix, creating a resorption cavity. This process takes about one and a half months. The osteoclasts are followed by a team of osteoblasts that refill the resorption cavity. This takes about five months, or more than three times the duration of the resorption phase. At the end of the cycle, the resorption cavity is refilled and a new packet of bone has been formed. As we leave the scene, we see several sites undergoing active remodeling. By continuously replacing old bone with new bone, the normal remodeling cycle maintains the mechanical strength of trabecular and cortical bone. Now, one of the issues, if you actually looked at that, is that the volume of the new bone was smaller than the volume of the old bone. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If that continues, you're going to end up being osteoporotic or osteopenia, and that's what happens. And then we talk about how to correct that with some of the drugs. Some of the drugs actually correct it by causing the filling to be larger in volume than the resorption. But this scene illustrates the imbalances in the remodeling process in a patient with osteoporosis. This postmenopausal woman has severe osteoporosis with a lumbar spine T-score of minus three, several vertebral compression fractures, and back pain. In the vertebral body, the cortical bone is thinner than normal and there is clear deterioration in the structure of trabecular bone. Instead of highly interconnected trabecular plates, we now have trabecular rods. The trabeculae are reduced in number and thickness and several are perforated. An increased number of osteoclast precursors leave the circulation. Osteoclast activity and the number of resorption sites are both increased. The osteoclast precursors fuse to form highly active osteoclasts. Bone resorption is followed by bone formation but when this is completed, the cavity is underfilled. Some osteoclast teams dig too deeply and perforate the trabeculae. Uh, and when you perforate the trabecula, in the trabecular bone, there, there are no blueprints. As a result of the high bone remodeling rate, there are numerous resorption cavities which act as mechanical stress risers, leading to an increased risk of microfractures at these sites. The deterioration of trabecular structure severely compromises its strength. So, and when cortical bone fractures, as you all know, we typically will get good healing. And what happens there is that the cortical bone fractures, you have a periosteum. The periosteum rows over the fracture site, and that periosteum then uh, is a uh, scaffolding which the osteoblast can use to generate new bone and correct the fracture. When you have trabecular bone, you don't have any periosteum in there. So when the trabecula is broken, the osteoblast can't cross the divide there, and so they stop. So once you get trabecular fractures, then you're actually at a point where you have an irreversible event. And uh, if you do drugs to try to improve the density, it doesn't make new trabecula. All it can do is thicken the old trabecula. So a uh, uh, fracture of trabecula is kind of an irreversible event, whereas a fracture of the cortex isn't. That, that can be, that be corrected because the, the body basically has no 3D blueprint of how to create new trabecula 
uh, once you've lost a trabecula in the body. And then if you look at ganglion, uh, well, not ganglions, if you look at cysts within the bone, what you'll often find out is you've got sclerosis around the cyst. Uh, and what that is, that's thickening of the trabecular bone because you have increased stresses on the trabecular bone around a hole in the bone. That increased stress induces more osteoblast formation of new bone. And so you get thickening, and that's that's really good because it then tends to help uh, increase the mechanical integrity of the bone. Uh, but the problem is you have a lot of cysts. Uh, you, you still do not have uniform transmission of forces through the bone, and that actually leads to bone remodeling and, uh, and less function of the bone uh, when that occurs. So, uh, no. so what we really want to do, and one of the things I think MR is very important, and one of the things that we found early on with MR of the knee, for instance, is that probably most of the time in the old days when we thought that knee pain was due to a meniscal tear, it was actually due to bone injuries. But these trabecular bone injuries could not be detected by x-rays or CT or ultrasound. We never really knew about them uh, until MR came along. And we certainly didn't realize how common they were until MR came along. Uh, but as we've already talked about, in certain locations, these trabecular fractures are at high risk for having the subchondral bone collapse or even completing to a complete fracture through the cortex. So they're high-risk lesions. So one of the most important things I think that MR has shown us is that there are high-risk lesions that we can detect by MR, which should change the management of patients to decrease uh, the risk of uh, subchondral fractures and destruction of the articular cartilage. So that's how osteoporosis happens. This happened. illustrates how anti-resorptive agents act to reduce resorptive activity and thereby prevent further deterioration in bone structure. Again, we consider the case of a postmenopausal woman who has severe osteoporosis with a lumbar spine T-score of minus three, several vertebral compression fractures, and back pain. In the vertebral body, the cortical bone is thinner than normal and there is clear deterioration in the structure of trabecular bone. The trabeculae are reduced in number and thickness and several are perforated. With the administration of an anti-resorptive agent, the number of osteoclasts formed is reduced. Fewer precursor cells fuse to form fewer osteoclasts. The reduced numbers of osteoclasts dig shallower resorption cavities. Bone formation follows resorption and at the end of formation, the cavity is almost completely filled. The number of active remodeling units is reduced to normal. Consequently, there are fewer mechanical stress risers on the surface of the trabeculae and trabecular perforation is reduced. Also as a consequence of the reduced turnover rate, trabecular mineralization is increased. The degree to which turnover decreases and consequently mineralization increases varies among different anti-resorptive agents. The relationship between mineralization and bone strength is not yet well characterized. Anti-resorptive agents also maintain the structure of cortical bone. Okay, let's let's look at a case before we do a little bit more here in terms of understanding the pathophysiology.
A 62-year-old woman left femoral pain with limping for a year, pain tenderness at both femoral shafts, bisphosphonate medication for 10 years. Um, okay, so here we see, I think, the femoral shaft. Yeah. And uh, we have some thickening of the cortical bone. And um, I mean, there's this irregular signal there, like linear transverse signal. Um, wow, that's uh, here, here are some other images in the same patient. So, what's going on here? Yeah, we, yeah, some uptake along that lateral femoral diaphysis, maybe bilaterally, more so on the left. Plain films, yeah, a little cortical bump. Um, I know this can be seen with bisphosphonate therapy. Um, so these are bisphosphonate associated fractures. They tend to occur in this location. Uh, uh, and is what it shows is that with biphosphonate, you can increase the density of the bone, but as they're alluding to, it's not necessary that by just increasing the density alone, you actually improve the stress capabilities of the bone. And these tend to be very characteristic. They tend to be very straight across. Uh, they're not jagged. And they don't. They look different from the typical fractures that we see in normal bone, and uh, and here they tend to be traverse. Uh, they tend to be very discreet. It looks more like a saw cut than uh, than a than a fracture than a typical fracture. It tends to be traverse uh, and uh, typically in this particular location. Uh, and uh, the, th the thought is that where bifosphonate may uh, increase the density of bone, it actually doesn't lead to remodeling of the bone and getting rid of those incomplete fractures. So that it doesn't stop the coalescing of those microfractures into a macrofracture. So it's, uh, uh, it only increases the density of bone. So it's important when you treat p patients, it's, you have to realize that uh, What's important is you improve the, the stress capabilities of the bone. Okay. So let's talk about it. In male and kind. female rats, teriparatide caused an increase in the incidence of osteosarcoma, a malignant bone tumor that was dependent on dose so, and treatment duration. So if you get something that works, it's going to kill you by cancer. exposures to teriparatide ranging from 3 to 60 times the exposure in humans given a 20 microgram dose. Because of the uncertain relevance of the rat osteosarcoma finding to humans, Teriparatide should be prescribed only to patients for whom the potential benefits are considered to outweigh the potential risk. Teriparatide should not be prescribed for patients who are at an increased baseline risk for osteosarcoma, including those with Paget's disease of bone or unexplained elevations of alkaline phosphatase, open epiphyses, or prior external beam or implant radiation therapy involving the skeleton. See warnings and precautions, carcinogenesis. Forteo, teriparatide rDNA origin injection is indicated for the treatment of postmenopausal women with osteoporosis who are at a high risk for fracture. These include women with a history of osteoporotic fracture or who have multiple risk factors for fracture or who have failed or are intolerant of previous osteoporosis therapy based upon physician assessment. See black box warning. In postmenopausal women with osteoporosis, Forteo increases BMD and reduces the risk of vertebral and non-vertebral fractures. Forteo, teriparatide or DNA origin injection, is indicated to increase bone mass in men with primary or hypogonadal osteoporosis who are at high risk for fracture. These include men with a history of osteoporotic fracture or who have multiple risk factors for fracture or who have failed or are intolerant to previous osteoporosis therapy based upon physician assessment. See black box warning. In men with primary or hypogonadal osteoporosis, Forteo increases BMD. The effects of Forteo on risk for fracture in men have not been studied. It's also used in athletes. Teriparatide is the first bone formation agent for the treatment of osteoporosis. While anti-resorptive agents reduce both resorption and formation, teriparatide increases formation. Again, we consider the case of a postmenopausal woman who has severe osteoporosis with a lumbar spine T-score of minus 3, several vertebral compression fractures, and back pain.
In the vertebral body, the cortical bone is thinner than normal and there is clear deterioration in the structure of trabecular bone. The trabeculae are reduced in number and thickness, and several are perforated. The initial action of teriparatide is to stimulate bone formation directly by activation of osteoblasts. In other words, teriparatide initiates bone formation without prior resorption. New bone is formed on trabecular surfaces. Traditional bone remodeling then begins. The bone remodeling rate is increased with a positive balance in each remodeling unit. Teriparatide stimulates increased osteoblast activity. When bone formation is completed, more bone is formed than was removed. Teriparatide's anabolic action increases skeletal mass and bone strength. That's why it's used in some athletes. As we leave the scene, we see the increased number of active remodeling sites. In each site, bone formation exceeds bone resorption. Furthermore, teriparatide also acts on cortical bone surfaces to form new bone. Please continue viewing to see black box warning and safety information for teriparatide. I'll skip that. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you think of this case? So, 55 year old female with four days of lower leg pain. Uh, so, yeah, there's like a. Got a little hole in the cortex, right? Uh huh. Lucency, well, the fine lucency in the cortex. That's what the CT scan looked like. Mm -hmm. Which you can see what it is there. See there's a little bit of density in the soft tissues. And this was just a little cortical barracks. Right, so we have 11 year old, eight months old female, pain for three months. Uh, let's see. And there's some lucencies in both proximal. So you have this funny yeah. stuff here. Yeah. So you want an MR scan, right? Yeah, absolutely. I know it. <laughs> so there's an MR. Uh, so there's some edema kind of surrounding the physis in both tibias. Okay, so it's kind of on both sides, but those other areas of lucency look pretty normal. Yeah. Uh, so this is really focal. Also, the, the growth plate here is getting pretty thin. Mm -hmm. So it's probably toward the end of uh, growth. Here are what the sagittal images look like. Yeah, so there's some edema surrounding the physis again. Looks like they're starting to fuse. Okay. Pet pain for one month, 12 year old female. Okay. Again, looks similar. Okay, and then. Uh, the x-rays again show this stuff that looks normal in the MR area. Yeah. Okay, this is the same patient now a few years later. So it looks like it's largely resolved. There's a little bit of residual signal, but right. the physis. Is... So do you know what this is? This is a focal periphyseal edema zone. <laughs> right, it's a focal lesion. Yeah. Uh, and these are considered to be normal. 
and they occur when you start getting facial closure. And, uh, and it may be associated with pain, uh, but it's important to recognize that uh, this isn't really trauma. This is a physiologic uh, event that occurs around the closure of the growth plates. Right, a girl, female, right, knee, pain. Normal or abnormal? Definitely abnormal. Um, That's a good start. So we have a fracture going through the metaphysis, physis, and emphysis of the anterior tibia, possibly. Is that one name? Or. Wait, this is the femur, right? Mm -hmm. There's a knee, there's a patella. So what's happening here? Um, genital insensitivity to pain. Is this a chronic fracture or some other? If you follow this 2013, 2016, 2016-2017, so you can see progressive discombobulation uh -huh. here, right? There are some other joints. So what's happening here? Um, that clubbing of the hands. I'm not sure. Well, whenever you get kind of discombobulation, large amount of hypertrophic bone formation, what do you think about is occurring? Um, where else do we see this? Well, we see it in diabetic feet, right? Like a, like a neuropathic? Yeah, this, uh, this is a neuropathic. The, the problem is if the patient develops a fracture, they don't have normal sensitivity, so they continue to weight bear on it, you continue to get more injury to the fracture site, the bone tries to heal it, it produces all this hypertrophic bone, but they keep fracturing through the hypertrophic bone. And so this is a, this is a typical neuropathic joint. This just happens to be someone who has a congenital syndrome where they have insensitivity to pain. And so they get these horrendous fractures. This is a rare autosomal recessive. But whenever you see this kind of you know, high, gross hypertrophic bone formation, fracture, then uh, almost always you're going to be dealing with some sort of a neurologic problem. Otherwise, it would hurt too much and they would stop moving and it would heal. Just other examples and other people of this uh, same phenomenon with here you get clubbing of the and resorption of the distal phalanges is also typical in this particular condition. So, you know, acroceolysis, prominent preosseal reaction, exuberant callus formation, and then they can also get uh, superimposed infections, and then you can go on to joint deformities. Okay. Okay, so coronal T1, uh, the femoral diaphysis, there's this irregular signal, serpiginous, maybe. What? Serpiginous signal. Okay. Maybe no. osteoporosis. Bone infarctant there. No. What do you think about the, the rest of the bone here, the trabecular pattern and the signal intensity? Well, this it's it's like a longitudinal pattern, um, which doesn't look normal. So, so what we're seeing here is the typical findings that you see in someone with severe osteoporosis. What we find is you have increased signal intensity on the T1 weighted image because you have uh, fewer trabecula, which means you have less susceptibility artifact where you lose signal. The trabecular that's left over tends to be more thickened, and you get marked hyperintensity on the T1-weighted images because it's all fat. 
And this is typically an older individual that doesn't have hematopoietic marrow either. So this is typically what osteoporotic uh, uh, bone looks like uh, on T1 weighted images. And uh, this patient also had a, a bone infarct. Okay. Um, the patient also is probably obese. Yeah, uh, that's female. true. Yeah. And um, in, the somebody who's obese will maintain the bone, but uh, this patient obviously is not very ambulatory, if ambulatory at all. Right. You don't see any trabecular bone uh, of, well, very little of it. What surprises me is that there's no fracture that I can see. Uh, not here, right. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, Natalia, I'm gonna skip you on this one. <laughs> All right, so we have an X-ray of the lumbar spine. It looks like a decreased bone mineral density and then okay. in the vertebral bodies and maybe increased at the end plates. Okay. I don't see a definite fracture here. Uh, well, it looks like a bone inside of a bone. Yeah. Does that ring any bells? It does, but I can't, can't find the answer at the moment. Here's a CT. Uh, yeah, same, similar picture. <laughs> I think Eller knows the answer to this one. See, you can certainly tell that this is abnormal bone, yeah. right? And this is what osteopetrosis is. Osteopetrosis, yeah. So it's out of some dominant, you get increased bone density, but you get this typical bone within a bone appearance and the typical Erlenmeyer fast deformities in the lung bones, especially the distal femur. Typically said. So this, this is just to kind of remind you of some of these bony things. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Premature amyloidosis respiratory experiment. Bunch of mineral. It's a patient from uh, Brazil. Okay, so premature respiratory distress. Uh, not great after our scores, but maybe it get a little bit better. Uh, the NICU for three months. I had surgery for PDA, respiratory distress on and off. And this is what? The x ray shows. Okay, so well, looks like that uh, one month. Okay. There's that three months. What was? Yeah. Um, so we have some cupping of those metaphyses, and uh, is this? Rickets? Uh, is my first thought. Um, so, what kind of things do you think about when you see this? Some sort of mineral deficiency, or, or you know, think about child abuse. But this is kind of generalized and yeah. you know, not typical. But but whenever you see what well, looks like. A, chronic bone injuries like this, you always have to think about that. Uh, but there was no birth trauma, uh, normal radiographs at one month, and then it became abnormal in the NICU, where you hopefully they're not going to have uh, child abuse in the NICU. Uh, they had prolonged TPN use. And here's at five months. Here's the PDA. And, uh, so you have a lot of periodic reaction. The other thing you have to think about are infections. You have to think about um, uh, malnutrition, uh, you know, like scurvy, for instance. Yeah. yeah. It says it's improved with vitamin D. Okay. Yeah. Where it gets. And this, this was congenital rickets. And this is kind of the classic metaphysical reason of uh, lesions that you build with 
with rickets and squeal. This is what child abuse is, and this is what rickets, so they are a little bit different. So this is a case of congenital rickets. So what's rickets? Um, what? It's a vitamin D deficiency, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I got better with vitamins. So, so yeah, hopefully in this day and age, uh, the TPN is going to be sufficient to give all of the nutrients that are necessary. But some of these old-fashioned diseases still can occasionally come up. And uh, I'd have to look into the differential. Okay, child in ER fall two weeks ago, irritability and crying. Um, yeah, so we see a fracture of the distal femur with displacement dissociation of that growth plate and uh, calcification, the surrounding soft tissues. So what do you think is causing this calcification? Uh, I mean, after a trauma, maybe like ossitis, ossificans. Um, what is it? This looks like it's associated with the bone. Mm -hmm. Okay. What can happen in kids uh, a fracture dislocation, doesn't it? Yeah, that's pediatric. Yeah, markedly displaced fracture here. Could um, it could it be like periosteal? Yes, this this uh, is a, a lot of displacement. Of alter, um, yeah. Is that all like a periosteal lifting? This is this is all a big periosteal hematoma. Oh. What's happened is that the periosteum then can calcify. Uh, due to uh, the chronic hematoma formation there. Mm -hmm. And this patient also had scurvy, which uh, leads to the risk. Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Natalia? This patient has a history of fibrous dysplasia. And the thing that we're concerned about is over here. Um, if you want an MR scan, that's what the MR scan shows. Normal over here, abnormal there. Mm -hmm. More images, there are the SI joints. We can see over here. So, uh, so, uh, so that's like a, so, like a tumor or something, or yeah, you know, it, it, it it's really pretty sharply demarcated here. Mm -hmm. And if we look at it, the margins are nice and sharp here on this T1 weighted image, uh, thickening of the bone in this location, and then uh, here it really looks a little bit uh, scalloped edges, uh, but this turned out also to be an old subperiosteal hematoma that's mm -hmm. then ossified and you're left with uh, uh, with you know what looks like an area of abnormal bone in reality this is just ossification mm -hmm. around the, the hematoma uh, that's what the normal bone should look like it should be much thinner than this you've got a lot of hypertrophic bone here due to the irritation of the chronic uh, subperiosteal hematoma. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right, we have a middle-aged male patient presenting with abnormal swelling over the left medial malleolus. And yeah, it looks like he has some abnormal swelling over that medial malleolus. <laughs> uh, looks like there's some, almost looks like heterotopic bone formation in that region. Yeah, but you can see it. Both, both sides are abnormal. Mm -hmm. A lot of periosteal reaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our hands. So I can lead. Yeah, so there's a little bit of bilateral clubbing. So we have kind of diffuse periosteal reaction with some clubbing of the fingers. <laughs> a 
with a lot of cortical thickening and irregularity. So, you know, one thing you want to ask is, does he have any relatives, right? Right. And what do the relatives look like? So there's not a lot of thickening. So there's a big differential diagnosis for this from... Uh, I, was, I was going to say, got a chest x-ray. Yeah, I agree, John. Uh, so you can think about uh, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, uh, acromegaly, thyroid disease, venous stasis, it's usually a little bit more asymmetric than this, proteus syndrome, infantile cortical aparostosis, Caffey's disease, hyperphytomatosis A. So there's a, a pretty big differential, but a uh, uh, patient came back with his brother, uh, a, and this turned out to be a congenital disease of pachydermal uh, uh, periostitis. Uh, primary hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. Okay, so I'd like to talk about acute injuries to the bone, and this is uh, something that we... Excuse me one second here. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about acute injuries to, to the bones. So uh, when we first started doing MR of the knee, uh, this was back in the late 1980s when I was uh, in Santa Barbara. Uh, we looked at the two, first 250 some odd cases of MR of the knee that we did at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. And uh, we looked at a number of different changes within the bone that we saw, and uh, it turned out the vast majority of these, the x-rays were negative. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we came up with three different types of signal abnormalities within the bone that really hadn't been described before. Uh, uh, one is where the cortex is intact, but you've got a lot of subchondral and metaphyseal edema. Uh, those days, we didn't have PD fat sat images. Uh, this is a T1-weighted image, and we can see the loss of signal intensity or fat signal intensity uh, here in the metaphysis. Uh, the subchondral and cortical bones look like they're intact, but it's just uh, abnormal marrow signal intensity. A type 2 was where we could see a break in the cortex, so that made us start thinking that this was, has something to do with trauma. Uh, most of the, almost all of these patients came in to evaluate for meniscal tears. And uh, we divided these into those with and without displacement. So a typical type 2 x-rays, uh, like in almost all of these, are perfectly normal. We can see a little bit of a, a subchondral uh, signal abnormality within the bone, a lot of epiphyseal abnormality, and we can see some cortical and subchondral uh, abnormalities here uh, laterally, as well as in patient. Uh, we looked at a number of different pulse sequences later on, and looking at this, this is a Major League Baseball player. Who's next? What do you think of this? Um, yes, yeah, so in the water sensor sequence, there's this oblique uh, signal there. I think the lateral tibial yeah, so plateau. This is water. So this is very similar to a PT fat set image. Yeah. In uh, phase image, which is very similar to a PD image without fat suppression. Uh, out of phase, the type, this is a fat image. Okay. Uh, the out of phase is very sensitive to where areas where you can have susceptibility changes within the bone. And uh, here you go. Wait a minute. Uh, the, okay, so on this right image, we see the, I think the lateral meniscus, and it looks, looks, it looks okay. Yeah. What do you think about the plateau? It looks, yeah, it looks in, intact, but yeah, some some irregular signal there. 
Yeah, so, so this, uh, this was a trabecular stress injury. Uh, I'll show a few more cases, then we'll go back talking about the, what's happening here. Uh, Natalia, what do you think of this 44-year-old worker? Unexpectedly stumbling to trench and twisted knee in extension. Mm. Mm. Uh, so there is like uh, edema on the... Right. So here this is a proton density fat suppressed sequence, so it's sensitive for water. Uh -huh. We see increased water here within the trabecular bone and the subcortical bone adjacent to the origin of the lateral collateral ligament here. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, as we'll see in a minute, the subchondral bone here, the far posterior articulating surface of the lateral femoral condyle. If we look over here, we can actually see that this, this patient has a, a grade two or maybe even a grade three tear of the medial collateral ligament with a lot of hemorrhage. So the uh, uh, edema in this area probably from hemorrhage. So this patient probably had a uh, valgus injury to the knee, uh, but kind of been more complicated, a twisting type injury with a traction injury to the bone here and a distraction injury to the superficial medial collateral ligament there. there. And, then, and there's some torque. Right. So I think it's probably torque, exactly. And we can see a little bit of a subchondral fracture here and the far posterior lateral femoral condyle, which would be back behind uh, where this is. Uh, this is on the T2 weighted image. So that was after the, the acute event, and if we do a sagittal PD fat sat image, here we can see that subchondral bone edema here, and we can see on the T2-weighted image that uh, fracture line here where the subchondral bone is, is fractured in this. Uh, and this may be a precursor of some of the far, lateral, far posterior chondral changes that, that we talked about in the articular cartilage section. Following up on this patient, a few months later, we can see that, that those signal changes have, uh, have healed and, and gone away. And here we can see it looks now very, very normal. So uh, looking at a lot of these, we, we really believe that these, this kind of edema is typical of trabecular microfractures or trabecular bone injuries. Uh, and this, uh, as John just said, is really more of a twisting, avulsive type injuries rather, and not really an impaction injury. There is no impaction kind of involved in this particular case. Okay. So, Natalia, what do you think of this case? Treated with rest for Oscar Schlatter, now increasing distal thigh pain. Mm. So, so what, what are the findings here? These are, this is PD, these are PD fat sat images. Mm -hmm. So, so is that like a fracture and edema? Okay, so we have edema. There's edema within the distal diaphysis mm -hmm. and throughout the metaphysis. And then we have a low signal line that kind of goes across here. And this is typically seen with low signal due to susceptibility artifact because you have fractured trabecular bone. When you fracture the trabecular bone, they become overlapped in random ways. Uh, next to the bone-water interface, you have a lot of magnetic field gradients which cause dephasing of the signal, and you get this typical low signal line along the fracture line. And that, that's really what it's due to. If you guys want, we could do physics lectures <laughs> later in the year and uh, where you could understand more what the dephasing means. Uh, and then here we have other images. Now, uh, what would you call this? Well, what kind of fracture would you call this? What kind of name is usually given to this? Um, the, okay. the name usually given to this is a stress fracture. Mm -hmm. So that's what everybody should use, though I really don't like that term. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's such a thing as a fracture without stress. So a stress fracture is one of those terms like a ganglion cyst, which I don't think really adds a lot 
to it. So I prefer to call these incomplete fractures, but that's not what people call it. You call it, go ahead and call it a stress fracture, and people will know what you're talking about. Here you can see some periosteal thickening here. John? Uh, the reason uh, that's called a stress fracture for most part is a re repetitive trauma. In other words, uh, the patient continues to to do what they're not supposed to do in spite of the fact that they have pain. And it gets worse with time. Eventually, a complete fracture occurs. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting about this case is that the periosteum is really quite elevated, and uh, that, that's obviously a fracture. Yeah. So, and it's uh, it's, it's uh, probably healing. Yeah. Right. So, so people kind of divides quote stress fractures into kind of two types. The most common one is the one John just talked about, which is actually repeated uh, uh, overstress on uh, a, a bone beyond the level uh, which the bone can withstand, which basically means you have enough stress to produce microfractures. You refracture the, the trabecular before the trabecular have a chance to heal. Uh, so therefore, the fracture tends to grow and, and extend across the bone. And eventually, if you keep up uh, re-injuring uh, uh, re it, without allowing the trabecular to heal, it will go into a complete fracture that can then dislocate. That's what happens to people who have it's, it's kind of, disease. It's kind of similar to, to what you're showing on Eli Lilly uh, osteoporosis situation. Uh, yeah. the, the bone is resorbed more than, uh, than uh, and it, it can be replaced. In this situation, the same thing, but uh, you're, you're losing more bone with the stress, then it can be, resor can be resolved and uh, healed. So the healing is uh, uh, not, it cannot be as good as uh, it should be because of the stress. Yeah. So For some people. The stress. Some people will then say this kind of thing. Uh, Pathophysiology in normal bone is kind of a stress fracture. In bone that's highly osteoporotic, it takes less stresses to do the same thing. And some people will call those insufficiency fractures because the underlying bone is not sufficiently strong to handle normal uh, forces. Wasn't this patient uh, um, Oscar Schlatter's patient? I don't know. Can you go back a slide? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. I remember that. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's, he was not behaving himself, maybe, <laughs> and, and, and got a little osteoporotic. Uh, uh, yeah. Maybe because he was put in a, finally put in a, maybe a cast or a no, splint. I, I, I don't think he was. He was put in that. If he'd been put in it, I mean, after, after, said he uh, afterwards. Oh, maybe afterwards, but he just uh, continued to do uh, sports activity, <laughs> even though it was he a was bad boy. Him, but he wasn't. Either the parents are bad, or the kids bad, uh, or or both. Okay, fine, good. Okay. All right, so we have two coronals. Uh, looks like there's a fracture of that medial tibial plateau with some edema and some edema in the tibial spines as well. What's happening here? I think it could either be traction edema from the ACL, most likely. Yeah, and this is another situation. This lets you know that the patient is continuing to be active and has stress. Uh, this is an active edema from a stress reaction from the ACL. And uh, here we can see a fracture uh, that uh, has kind of acute and chronic findings. If it were all acute, you typically have a more a straight line. Uh, here you can see that there's a lot of irregularity here because you've got some resorption of the bone along the traction. So the body's trying to heal this and uh, the patient's not allowing it to heal properly. Uh, and, but but uh, this was a skier and this was all part of uh, uh, 
for repetitive ski injuries. Okay. All right, lateral knee radiograph. Um, I mean, I'm not seeing much of the uh, anterior part of the tibia, yeah. but I don't know if this is underexposed yeah, or... Well, well, this is right as normal. Uh, notice this particular line right here. Okay. Okay. So, uh, this was again in the very early days, like 1989, for doing MR of the knee. And we were doing those studies for free to try to see uh, if we could generate some interest from the orthopedic surgeons in Santa Barbara. Uh, this is actually a patient of Dr. Rick Reus. And uh, so we got an MR scan. Uh, that we, we did the MR scan. Uh, the, the patient was scheduled for surgery the next day for a presumed meniscal tear. And here's what the MR scan shows. So it looks like we have a depression of the lateral tibial plateau posteriorly. Right. And notice that the cartilage is still intact here. So actually, when the orthopedic surgeon saw this, he canceled the surgery because we didn't see any injury to the meniscus. And what is here is a, was a depressed uh, fracture, which he was concerned he might not have been able to pick up at arthroscopy because the cartilage looked like it was intact. And he did a percutaneous stabilization procedure of the impacted fracture instead of arthroscopy in this particular patient. So that was one of our first patients that really changed the management by using MR. Well, you do have to elevate that bone uh, um, and, and, um, and put a graft uh, below the fracture. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that needs a surgical intervention. That's not going to um, remember this patient is lying down as the MRI is being performed. Right. Um, but if the patient stands up, uh, there's a different story. Okay. Yep. Okay, so in the I think the lateral Let me stop here. Right. And we'll pick up on this, say by the bell. Uh we'll uh start here uh tomorrow. Okay, any questions? Thanks, John. Uh, thank you. And uh, have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.